I did not realize that uh, you guys were here and it's quite sad for you that you're here. If you're here, it means that you've exhausted everything else that is way better than this and are here because you don't have anything else to watch. But then I can't be sad about it. At the end of the day, any YouTube channel wants views wants subscribers, wants likes and upload to hume free me de doge. Just you know, gambling on how good you are and I hope you are good and not like the ones who run our country right now. I'm not talking about our Prime Minister guys, please. There are many other people. Spare him. He's doing a lot of work. Come on. So uh, you might have read the name of the video and uh, the name of the video is Let's Be Frank. So if anyone used to watch a news channel 3-4 years back and there was one person who had a loud voice and used to wear specs and somehow I shifted to another channel where he still wears specs and still shouts. Those are some characteristics which don't change. But then the, those are what made him what he is don't think he's a puppet come on yeah. come on. don't criticize people for their views no matter how wrong they are i'm not saying they're wrong you are so let's be frank is a show sasta wala show on youtube and uh, it is a very uh, sasta version of uh, any talk show because we don't have any finance to spend on Zoom calls, any finance to spend on post-productions. So we will show you what it is, real life. I mean, that's what you want to see, right? The ground, tr reality, truth or whatever you want to call it. So we are giving you that. If we are complaining, then you know who's the hypocrite. I'm not talking about Amit Shah. So moving on. The first episode of Let's Be Frank and I know I have not explained what Let's Be Frank is and I very well know that you are not interested to know what Let's Be Frank is. So Let's Be Frank is a talk show where I talk to people of my age or a bit elder to me. I have not had anyone younger because it's a inferiority complex. Keep people younger to me are doing great things. So in, in that way we are a bit selfish and uh, narcissistic if you might say. And uh, so moving on, in the first episode, I have invited over a person who has been my senior in school, who's still my senior. Don't go by her looks. She might look like a junior to many of you and even me. But she is a senior. She lives in Bangalore. She's originally from Guwahati, where we shot uh, the video from my part, because I am in Guwahati. And urban youth and people are sound are based in Guwahati. So of course you don't have the budget to go outside and shoot. Come on. Give in air. So the first guest on my first episode of Let's Be Frank is Janvi Gagar. Janvi Gagar lives in Bangalore. She's a social worker. She has been interning for many uh, companies or many organizations. Organization would be the right word. And she has done a lot of work in all the years that she has spent in Bangalore. So, the discussion that will be on your screens after some time, after I'm done blabbering, because I also need screen time here. Yeah? Because otherwise these guys will have all the screen time, what will I do? So, in that way, we will talk about social work, we will talk about educational opportunities in Bangalore, we will talk about the difference between Assam, between Bangalore, and... Uh, I, you know, I know I said between twice and that's grammatically incorrect. Stop being grammar Nazis. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. I mean, it's not so much lot of what badi baat hai, given the times that you're living in and given the WhatsApp chats and the forwards that you're reading. Such knowledge has really become quite necessary. I'm not boasting, but yeah, I'm knowledgeable compared to you know, who? I'm not talking about the BJP. Why will you just go there every time? 
So let's start the discussion. You will now see somewhere on your screen a certain kind of transition happening and uh, two persons will appear out of which I'll be one because screen time and selfishness are some things that I need a lot. Bear with me and please watch the video. It's good. I hope. Welcome to the very first episode of Let's Be Frank, which is presented by Urban Youth in association with the people of Sam. First of all, let me thank you on a personal and professional level for uh, accepting my invitation to be here, to be as a guest. Also helping me out with uh, gathering other people for the roster for who will partake in the interview series as we proceed. So uh, first of all, I know you at a personal level. But uh, many of who, who are viewing this right now, they won't because uh, you have mostly uh, achieved all that you have achieved uh, and that you have done to build, build your CV in Bangalore, per se, if I'm not wrong. So I would just ask you to be, uh, you know, very frank and very, uh, since we are calling the show, let's be frank, very frank and very... Uh, outspoken about uh, what you are doing currently in the pandemic, before the pandemic, uh, with your life, with Bangalore. All right, all right. Sounds great. Hello, Viprajit, and it's good to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I say I was shocked, but I was also very flattered. And it's nice to be here and, you know, just talk about things. And let's be frank. On that opportunity note, you know, uh, I've... Uh, I know that uh, in your uh, high secondary years, you were a science student. Then you moved on to a completely different field of media, communications, English and psychology, which are of course diverse in their own spheres. And then you also moved on to volunteering and social entrepreneurship. And if I pair that up with the current trends at, you know, uh, the level at which or the magnitude of students from Northeast who are uh, immigrating to cities like Bangalore or Delhi or any other place in the mainland India for uh, their higher studies. So, if and consider the current uh, you know dilemma with their academic fate due to the pandemic. So, if you can tell our viewers, tell our viewers who would be uh, you know taking this journey or commencing this journey very soon after everything normalizes. Was it difficult for you to settle down in Bangalore because it's a city where the language is unknown, where people you don't know? How how tough was it to, you know, acclimatize and normalize yourself into the society in with the people around you? And uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, were you faced with any difficulties based on where you come from or who you are or any other factors as such? So just let our uh, people know who are watching this that what, they might face when they go to a city like Bangalore or any other university that is not in their hometown? I guess one word which describes my, you know, uh, transition from Kohati to Bangalore was overwhelming. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed when I come here, because when I came here, because it's a very different space. Like if you see, uh, till the time you are in school, you have a very cushioning around you. So. You know, even if you mess up somewhere or even if anything goes wrong, you have a very nice cushion to fall back on. And Guwahati being a place where I've always stayed, it was a very safe space for me. So I knew everything like, okay, if I do something wrong, I know where to go and make it right. But when I came to Bangalore all alone, it was scary because, oh, I have to be independent now. I'm a college student. I have to, you know, mingle with people from different states in India. It's a microcosm like Bangalore. It has people from all the different states, people from abroad. So there are a lot of people here and everyone with their, you know, different upbringing, different ideologies and different outlook towards life. So initially in Christ, the university I was in, Christ has a lot of students. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very huge crowd <laughs> and I was in the main campus. I so I had, around... I, very well aware of that. <laughs> I had around 20,000 students around me every day and everyone different. So I was very overwhelmed initially, but in terms of coming from Northeast, I didn't have a problem as such with, you know, my peers or my professors or the people I worked with, but with the local communities a little, like getting an auto ride or, you know, asking someone for direction 
or talking to some street vendor so initially these were the small little things which caused me a little problem even they weren't receptive to you know people from different states coming in because if you see bangalore right now the kannadiga population in, in bangalore has reduced majorly and you know so they have that kind of an i feel like an animosity towards others or you know it's just a little hostile behavior initially so it took me a little time to get acclimatized to it but then after i did i feel people are really sweet here though i am still not well versed with the language so i feel like if you know anyone like if you are coming traveling to some other state like knowing a little bit of the language of the native language really helps and it's also nice to you know like <coughs> it's nice to you know diverse your you know expand your horizons as well like i have a fun time learning kannada at times like i know a few words and then so it's a good experience initially you have to be a little strong you're away from home you're away from your comfort zone and in a different place where you don't have anyone you know ready to give you a cup of water, a cup of tea or hot water or anything but i guess you get a hang of it as in when you know cuz you get to experience too many things here on that note would you say that uh, whenever you travel to any other uh, state or a city as such which has a you know a sprawling education sector and is receiving uh, students every year in huge numbers for example bangalore or delhi or bombay per se so has such a feeling of hostile hostility grown as you said among the locals there that our culture might be affected by uh, this uh, you know a uh, sprawling immigration educational immigration uh, trend that is on the rise every year it this year might be a bit different yeah. due to the pandemic but if in general we speak it's more that we see that uh, students in guwahati don't want to study here they mostly arc students or commerce students they want to go out they want to explore more and ex- uh, get more opportunities in comparison to what they get here so do you feel that this hostility in the locals will keep rising and will at some point of time make it difficult for students to uh, accommodate and uh, normalize themselves um see if i if i want an ideal situation i wouldn't want this hostility to be there but if you look at it in a practical way this host- cuz for them it's someone else you know coming in like i i feel like this is a kind of hostility which is going to continue though it is going to diminish like that's for sure like even i have experienced that in the 3 years because initially when someone else like you know someone from the north east they come to bangalore even they have trouble you know being receptive to the norms of this place so it's a both way street and every time you know like even i would be like i want everything to be how it is how it was back home and if it isn't even i would be, become a little aggressive at times so i feel like it's a two way street like even we need to be receptive of you know a different culture when we are you know coming to a different state and plus for these people especially the local people here i have realized one thing till the time you are respect you are respectful to someone they reciprocate so this hostility is something which might be a little you know a difficult thing for a lot of people to you know overcome because initially when you come it is scary and as soon as you get this hostility you know a wave of this suddenly you are taken aback a little but i feel like till the time you are open to you know accepting different cultures and open to being you know respectable and being just normal with everyone around it automatically subsides so yeah so that whatever you have discussed with us right now and given us an idea of gives us a clearer picture and gives us a clearer picture that we could you know forward to our viewers about uh, the challenges that they might face in the upcoming uh, academic life of theirs plus what the pandemic will have in its bag and what will unfold that's all available but you know on the other hand if i go uh, for your professional side uh, you have been working uh, on a more of a social basis uh, i can call you a social entrepreneur maybe you have been working with street entrepreneurs uh, with Mar- uh, mata media who's a, who's a ceo would be joining us again for another episode of let's be frank so we right. and I'll not disclose the name I'll keep it as a surprise so that uh, we don't lose viewers for that uh, how I, even I, 
Yes. Uh, so, on that note, uh, you know, uh, this pandemic saw a different uh, image when it came to the poor, when it came to these street entrepreneurs who depended on their uh, day-to-day activities, day-to-day sales of their products. And you have worked closely with them. So, I would want you to, you know, tell me that uh, what do you think uh, these people would do right now when their uh, resources are very limited, what they can do for themselves is very limited. And uh, do you see any kind of uh, ideas or uh, initiatives that could actually help these people in such trying times and also keep them safe again? Um, so social work is something I'm really passionate about. So after coming to Bangalore, I've worked with, you know, different sectors of people like I worked with street entrepreneurs like uh, with street vendors like you mentioned I worked with you know at risk children in Bangalore and different shelter homes here I have worked with old age home people and you know different people and I realized that this pandemic has hit everyone in very different ways like for us it is that we aren't able to go to college or outside to our schools and stuff like that for these people, their entire livelihood has been disrupted for a good four to five months now. And if I talk with respect to street vendors, so they have been hit so bad because their entire livelihood was dependent upon being on street and having customers coming in. And what I have seen in Bangalore that a lot of you know small NGOs they have come together and they have taken steps to you know ensure that there is enough funding for them to at least sustain themselves for a while. So like even we did this thing, if you'll get more details later, but then so for the street vendor we were working with closely. So we raised, you know, we did a full fundraising program for him online and we got funds and you know, now we are at least hoping that, you know, he would be able to sustain his family for a few more months because his entire, uh, the income he would incur was through the shop that he would put outside our college, which is no more. College is shut and no one's ready to go outside and, you know, to like just have a chart or something. So I feel like fundraising... Even for them, it is necessary to stay inside, right? Even for these uh, street vendors, it is necessary for them to stay safe because their job, it has a high uh, proximity rate with people... uh, on the streets and on the footpaths and the number of people that they come in contact with every day is huge. So even for their safety and their family's safety, because this is something that is contractable and uh, can be passed on to. So, but still uh, on a livelihood basis, do you think that if I'm talking particular of Bangalore right now, I believe the unlock phase is going on. So do you feel that these people are have are back on the streets because their livelihood is in question and uh, is their safety being taken care of by the authorities and what do you see in future for these street vendors who who depend on day-to-day uh, sales and activities you rightly pointed out it is important for them to stay indoors as well so um if i talk about bangalore in particular so i just went for a you know just a stroll the other day and I realized that there are a few street vendors who are out on the streets now because they have to, you know, get going. And there are people also coming out on the streets a little, obviously taking precautions. There are authorities who are at every check post, every signal, ensuring that, you know, the people are wearing masks, street vendors are using gloves, they have a sanitizer with them, you know, the little things that they can and they're ensuring that not a group of, you know, more than five people are together in a at a street vendor vendor stall or you know in any hotel or stuff like that so people are trying but everyone is scared and rightly so so not a lot of street vendors are coming out a few of them are yet at a risk of you know uh, having to catch uh, the virus going back home especially i have seen this that so i have been interacting with a lot of street vendors over the past two years that i was a part of street entrepreneurs my venture so uh, I have realized that most of the street vendors who have, you know, children at home, who have small kids at home, they are refraining from coming outside. A few of them who are, you know, young and who have been staying alone and having their small shops, they are still open to the idea of coming and authorities are taking step. But like you, um, there's no guarantee about this. Like you never know because 
even in Bangalore, like people were extremely scared initially. No one was coming out on the street, but but then everyone got tired of it. And now, if you see, there are a lot of people on the street. Few of them have given up on wearing masks, though the authorities are after them. So there's not the people are kind of you know they have become very complacent with the whole situation which is there, and I feel like that is something which puts them at risk plus everyone around. Because you know people are okay with going to small shops without masks. Yet the street vendor himself is, you know, wearing a mask, trying to be precautious. But then there are people who are not doing it. So, the as in a lot of people are very, they have become very complacent with the whole Corona situation right now. And I feel that puts the street vendors into a difficult position as well. And that's why they are choosing to go back. A lot of them they wanted to go back to, you know, the places that they have come from, their native towns. Yet they weren't able to because they know that. Here, at least, they have a little chance of you know getting a little money. If they go out for one day, maybe they can get something. But if they go back to their native homes, there is no scope of that. So I guess that is one fear which made them stay in Bangalore. And yeah, like they are trying to work around the situation, looking at you know how the day spans. Like so that's that's a very wonderful insight into, and it's you know it's always useful for uh, us to have insights about such people from. Uh, people like you who have actually worked in uh, close proximity with them and know how they function, how their lives function, and uh, what are the things that they look forward to every day when they start their work, and uh, how what is their condition. Because on a very uh, general sense or a basis, the media or the any other source will not give us such information about the realities of life for people like these. Who, who we can call uh, uh, daily wage uh, uh, laborers or uh, people who depend on daily wage for uh, running their livelihood. So that's a very wonderful insight, and I thank you for it. On the point of you know talking about social work, working with these street vendors and everything, uh, let me come to this point that today I don't know if you have noticed this or uh, see this trend that there is a very uh, skeptic kind of attitude towards uh, social work and. Uh, how it will help you if you indulge yourself in social work and many people somehow uh, you know tend to uh, run away from it or not get involved in it thinking that it is not only their responsibility and there are other people who might uh, you know uh, take up the social tasks of uh, helping these people out uh, who need their help so since you have been involved in social work and that too in a place where you will not where you were not familiar with in the past so could you just tell us that what motivated you to uh, get into this entire field of social work and given that you're still here what motivates you every day to wake up and uh, help these people and help the society as a whole so just give us an idea so that we can pass on to people who actually want to indulge in social work but don't have a clearer idea about it um i'll just i'll like to share a small thing so how i got interested into social work was back when i was in 4th grade <laughs> so my school took me to this orphanage in guwahati snehalaya to spend one day with the kids and enjoy and that's the day so we had this activity where we you know had to pair with one of the kids at, from the orphanage and just spend the entire day with them make them eat their lunch get them to draw something teach them numbers tables and stuff like that and it was by far one of my best days in guwahati i remember that date i still remember the kid i was paired with rakesh he was a small boy and i had to you know like help him do his things and make him study and i realized that i really enjoyed teaching him he was so innocent and he was just open to learning anything that i had to you know put in front of him so that's when i realized that was i guess my first exposure towards how there are other people who are suffering till that time i was a small kid i was in 5th grade so i didn't i was in 4th grade sorry and i didn't realize you know ki there are people who are suffering from some things and that's when i realized and that just i was hooked i was sure that you know whatever i do i want to at least ensure that i give kids a better livelihood so that's how my journey started in guwahati i just kept my association with sneha lai and i used to teach kids at times and then when i came to bangalore and i realized that people are very open to the idea of you know students involving into social work especially my course so my professors 
they were very open with the idea of you know me wanting to intern with an ngo or help kids or you know just run a social media campaign for fundraising and all of these things and we have a huge wing in christ which is center for social action and i that's when i realized i was like wow yeah. here people are doing a lot for the communities who are suffering and that's when i decided i was like this is where i want to tap in uh so i started off in my first year one of uh, there's an ngo called indest i am a part of indest indest is an ngo started by one of my friends back he was when he was in school in mysore he brought it to bangalore and we just formed a community of 80 students from our department and we decided that we want to do something for the betterment of people around and that's how it started we made a we built a kindness wall near our college which is a place where you know anyone can come and donate anything and everything except for money and food and we used to organize monthly donation drives collect all the clothes books utensils wash them fold them make sure they are in proper condition and we used to go to different slum areas in bangalore spend the day with the kids there give them the clothes you know have some fun activities with them and that's how i started in bangalore and indest became a major part of my you know everyday activity like that's when i realized that i can do a lot with just so, so basically uh, what do you do at indest so is it basically for any particular section of the underprivileged community or uh, any other section of society that you look for or is it as a whole working towards just societal development at any level So, indest is a community of peers working towards a social change we do not as as in particular you know like we only want to work towards the education sector or mental health as such we are working towards every segment of you know the social problems that we have in our society that we can you know make sure that we eradicate these problems through innovative ways because like you brought the topic of social you know social work and you know the the whole sector of social work and why people are very apprehensive towards involving themselves in it is because it's a very saturated sector if you see social work we have a few ngos which are very prominent in our country and you know everyone's like okay these are the ngos they get their funding they do things for people and then we have the corporate social responsibility companies all involving in csr but and that's why it looks like a very saturated field because every company has to do it but when you see these are very small tiny steps if you actually think about the social evils we have in our society or you know the disadvantaged communities in our society from my perspective there's no amount of work which would you know be ever saturated or enough to help these communities because there are so many people in need of so many things and people always involve in you know little things to you know just ensure that okay we are we are doing something for the community and that's it that's where they draw the line or most of the people want to help them financially and that's where they draw the line yeah so uh, what i just get here is uh, about the you know how a field like uh, social work has also been you know uh, saturated and concentrated with people who are uh, either from uh, as you said known ngos or from uh, uh, or are serving from a very uh, Uh, need that the corporate sector places on them and uh, also because a uh, corporate sector wants to maintain its uh, social image and uh, social capital if i must if i may say so on on that note do you feel that social work is still authentic or is just done as a maybe a way to promote yourself or a way to climb the stairs of uh, success or uh, oh you know being famous faster because we you can see the people who are doing social work they are clicking their pictures they are do, uh, in the name of charity and everything promoting as much so are they promoting so can, uh, one might one might say that they are are they promoting themselves or promoting the very message of doing social work so do you feel that you being involved in this field it's still authentic to its objective to its uh, very fundamental basis see i feel that's a very subjective take because it's a field like i have the opportunity to work with say for example the 100 ngos which are in india there are a lot of them who are actually doing authentic work and you can see the results so i was working for this ngo called action aid and 
till that time i was like great okay i'm working for a big ngo i'll be teaching kids and i didn't have you know i didn't realize you know what i'll be actually doing with the kids that i go to teach for 6 months i taught the kids and i did realize that they genuinely need help and you know whatever i was doing like every day when i go to teach them it is making a difference because they are learning something they are trying to open up so it's a very subjective feel like you know you need to decide whether you know a pr based social work is your priority or actually helping the community is and i guess this is where you know most of the families i will say like so i come from a family who wasn't very supportive for social work initially so this is where the families have the you know doubt ki are you actually going to make a difference or you know you are just going to be one of those you know organizing fundraising and just you know helping people in the name of that but that's up to you like i know that i am passionate about mental health and kids education and at risk children so i'm going to do anything to make sure that i help them maybe i'm not that passionate about someone else so i feel this the idea that you know if you are into social work you have to help or everyone like you cannot choose which ones to help i guess that is a very flawed concept because you cannot do everything <laughs> i've realized this because initially i was like i want to just help people but i realized that my strengths so, yeah, and there is you know, a feeling to help everyone everyone you see yeah like it's a great that's feeling that's not possible yeah but then i feel like you need to if you genuinely want to make a difference in life of you know others you need to pick that pick that sector or pick those that community where you think that you can actually make a difference like since i love teaching and i am very fond of kids i know that i can do make a difference when i'm you know talking to kids maybe not that much when i am talking to people in the old age homes or you know people or older people so i feel like social work when it comes to social work you need to know what you are passionate about and that's the most that's the biggest driving force you'll get one more word that struck me uh, you know uh, while you were saying all of this uh, was mental health and uh, on that note uh, if i uh, talk about mental health so this pandemic and the lockdown which followed uh, due to the pandemic and due to somehow minimize its effects has had multiple impacts on different people's life and different people's uh, uh, health uh, on the perspective of uh, their uh, mental uh, awareness and also about uh, how their mental health was being affected because many many of us don't know that we are actually being affected by something that is not affecting us physically but taking a toll on our emotions taking a toll on our uh, 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 mind and uh, we somehow tend to ignore it so you know mental health has played a very big part in this lockdown period there have been people who succumbed to it uh, it's sad that they did but people are still succumbing to it every day there might there are these uh, uh, laborers and these workers and these farmers who were affected the most due to this lockdown and they chose to give up their life because they couldn't just take the pressure of not having anything to eat or uh, having problems to earn their livelihood and run their family then there have been students who have uh, dis- who decided to give give up their life due to all these reasons that came up due to the lockdown so how do you see as a person who has been involved with the people working uh, on the street every day and earning their livelihood depending depending on a very large scale on how many people they interact with and how much things that they can sell so do you see mental health as one of the most important factors right now especially in times of the pandemic and how do you see and how do you would like to suggest rather that we deal with our mental health we deal with uh, the problems that are associated with our mental health and uh, all of this sorts you know where i'm going so we can just address this point my journey with mental health uh, being a psychology student so that's when i got introduced to the whole concept of you know mental health until then it was an idea for me i i have i hadn't seen it in close proximity so i was very i was like okay it is a problem in our society that's all that was my understanding of mental health after studying psychology and you know actually getting to know the 
situation in our country about men- for mental health or around the world and how people deal with mental health that's when it hit me that if i have to say that it is one of the biggest problems i wouldn't be wrong because mental health is something we have ignored for so many years like we just think that you know okay if you're having a little bit of mood swing okay if it's a kid get a chocolate you'll be happy if it's if you know someone has work pressure okay stop working chill a little you'll be done but that's not it and i guess that is where as a society we go wrong because the idea of we have stigmatized mental health so badly that people are just not receptive to the idea that you know there can be something like mental health which is this important to a person's life and that's where i started you know getting involved in mental health and you know trying to destigmatize the whole notion of mental health and eradicate this taboo which persists in our society and during this pandemic i guess mental health has been one of the biggest or you know one of the topic which needs the most emphasis and i feel social media isn't doing ju- doing justice to it because i have realized one thing like people think that if you want to know about mental health you go to social media there will be pages which will tell you how mental health is how to deal with stuff during this pandemic and that's all that's done i have also seen this seen this trend that once someone succumbs to the pressures of mental health and uh, decides to give up his or her life and has taken some other drastic step that that is the point of time when these uh, social media people somehow come to you know they rise from their sleep it's it's much like that they are posting quotes about uh, your mental health they are asking people to talk to you if you feel alone or something like that so do do you feel that there is this uh, inherent uh, culture in our uh, uh, society at this point of time which just thinks of uh, capitalizing on an opportunity where whenever it comes and rather not focusing on the problem and how to solve it if you think about it it is so sad that someone has to take his or her life in order for a society to start talking about mental health i mean this is the place where we you know this is how our society has looked at mental health ki until and unless you see the problem or you know i i was very surprised how social media you know took to mental health and how the mental health is important for a person after someone gave up his life and that's when it hit me it it actually hit me for two days i was off social media because i couldn't comprehend the thing i was like you all know that mental health is important there are people doing something about it trying to you know educate you trying to make you aware about what mental health is how important it is you have turned a blind eye to them until and unless someone posted a picture on social media so <laughs> this is just a very very <laughs> skewed concept our society has about mental health that if mental health is trending yes mental health is important if it is not it's okay get back to work mental health is just yeah, and then some of these people who just disappear who you know somehow at the point at the very uh, uh, limelight uh, point of time to post these instagram stories or social media updates about how you should contact them or uh, just talk to them out of the blue i mean it's also about a person's comfortable com- a comfort level to talk to someone so do you feel that the mechanisms to tackle with uh, mental health issues are still low or are still uh, on the uh, you know minimal side of uh, functioning and uh, what do you where do you see you know uh, since your work since a psychology student where do you see that we are lacking at this point of time and what should we do in order to tackle these problems that mental health poses um if i'm not wrong uh I guess 2 years back when I was researching on mental health I came up with this I came across this stat that for every 30000 or 40000 people in India there is one mental health professional and just imagine that, that's, huge. that's that's huge that's and this is when you know this is why you think ki there are a lot of people studying psychology if you see almost all the colleges in India are providing psychology as a course right now and a lot of people are enrolling but how come mental health is still a taboo in the society that's because first reason psychology i not psychology the mental health treatment is a little expensive in our country if you see and 
it's expensive and lack of awareness these are i guess the two things that i would really you know want to talk about cuz people are just not aware about mental health for them it is a concept it come and for them it is a very youth concept they think that it is the college students who are affected you know who get mental health uh, illnesses like they are the ones who are talking about mental health for us for the older generation it is not a concept anymore this is so wrong because if say for example a student is suffering through something it's the, it's his or her parents or family support which is going to play a major role in you know helping that person deal with the problems but we have a huge divide in the society where mental health is a very trending social media youth concept and this is what creates lack of awareness first for the you know like our past generation second for our generation we have romanticized mental health to such an extreme that everyone is a mental health advocate when it comes to social media or you know or when they have to talk about it all the psychology students will be like yeah we know all about mental health but when you actually go read up about it or you know meet people who are suffering through something that's when you realize that this whole idea that you know we have ki you know if we are talking to three people about mental health that's great that is us helping the society or making them aware about mental health i feel this is not right because we don't know what to talk about we always talk about mental health from a very if a psychology student i will go full detailed technical when i'm talking about mental health or if someone you know someone like my friend who's not from a psychology background they will talk about mental health in the most generic way and there is such a disparity in the kind of conversations we have about mental health that we are actually not conveying the actual reason the cause the you know the solution for mental health that we can you know help our society with yeah, and then there are also these uh, stigmas that exist in the society you know that uh, just somehow tend to uh, put the issues of uh, mental health uh, towards a uh, towards a area where it feels like it's just something that's a disease it's it, it, it's another disease that you will treat with a medicine that a doctor gives you and it will be fine so do you feel that the society or the stigmas and uh, that the society and the taboos that the society have attributed to such things are also playing a major part right now and are showing their uh, consequences and are actually one of the major factors responsible for people uh, succumbing to the pressures of mental health to everyone out there who thinks social work is a saturated field and an unorganized sector let me tell you that it's not because the disparity in our society in terms of resources social acceptance finances is major it's vast and we can always work towards bridging this gap and no amount of help is small and i feel like it's us the youth who can bring in innovation creativity and passion to help communities enable themselves and to ensure a more equal society okay guys i'm back i hope you had a good time listening to whatever we spoke about listening to about the opportunities in uh, bangalore how you should enter social work and why social work is not something that should be seen as just for those who don't have anything else to do and why it is not a taboo or it is not something that is just a waste of time towards the end i will just uh, you know tell you something there will be a routine that i will follow that at the end of every video i will uh, suggest you a book so this book i know i'm hiding someone's face but i'll show you be patient okay don't make hasty decisions like not like nirmala sitaraman she has made decisions no matter how bad they were but uh, i did not say that but uh, yeah so i will uh, tell you about some books and uh, these books will be helpful at least they were helpful for me agar aapko samajh mein aaya to it will be helpful nahi aaya to apna apna dekh lo so these books are some of my favorites some books that i have uh, cherished reading and remembering throughout these years so the first book in that uh, list is my experiments with truth not mine mahatma gandhi's handwritten autobiography this is a book that has been published by navjeevan uh, the navjeevan 
publishing company that Gandhi himself was a part of. And uh, why you should read this book? Because I'm not telling you to read this book because you should idolize Gandhi. But this is something that is a truth about everyone, about how we run away from our mistakes, about how we don't accept them, about how Gandhi was not a perfect man, but still he was a man of principles and he learned those principles over his life. And there are many things to learn. You can, he's criticizing himself openly here, so can you. You don't have to fall in love with Gandhi. Anyways, he has a wife, so he's made it clear that he's not open to, you know, double diving. So, other than that, read this book. You'll find many online PDFs for this book. And this is one of the wonderfully written and compiled autobiographies, I feel. And uh, it gives you a lot of knowledge. Till then, till you decide whether to read this or not, I will get lost from your screen and not take any more of your data packs or waste them rather. See you on the next episode which will be coming soon. Please be cleaner. It will not be bad. I have tried to gather people from all over the country and truly I am not joking. They are. They might be living somewhere else. They might be from the northeast but they are living somewhere else. So all over the country. That is our PR strategy. So judge mat karo. Judge mat karo. Don't be rude. Don't be arrogant. Try to be happy. In your home, of course, don't go out partying and be happy because otherwise you will have Moti Ji on our screens telling us how important lockdown is. Come on, he does not waste our time. Who says he wastes our time? But yeah, see you soon.